Good afternoon, cybersecurity community, and welcome back to Las Vegas, Nevada. We're midway through our two days of coverage here on theCUBE. My name is Savannah Peterson. Delighted to be joined by John Furrier and a very special guest. John, what's the coolest thing you've learned this week? Well, we learned that security is still top of mind, built in from day one. Product sprawl continues to happen. More threats are out there, and just it's not stopping, and, and Gen AI is causing the bad actors yeah, the to get more action. Yeah, the velocity is palpable. Yeah, and so you know, the, the platform conversation continues leveraging existing tools, and it's a real risk management show in my mind. It's turning into, okay, what's, what's the risk profile, and how do we stop the surge? Yeah. yeah, well, and what better guests to have talk to us about it than Rick from Sentinel One. Rick, thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you for having me. Lovely to be here. You know, we've been talking about your popularity at the show, and I, I just have to ask, big incident two weeks ago, all eyes on cybersecurity right now, even if you knew nothing about cybersecurity before, so many people impacted. What have the last two weeks been like for you? Very interesting, very, very <laughs> intense. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, think the, the fallout for us was more around our customers reaching out to us and saying, how can, how, 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 like, how vulnerable are we to this? Yeah. And for, I mean, fortunately we have very good answers to that in terms of how we structure our deployments. We do phased rollouts. So, you know, it's very easy for us to detect issues on an update um, going out. And that's something that I think is obviously um, a sensitive topic around it and mm -hmm. was definitely something that was missed in that deployment that took out so many endpoints. But a lot of it's just been appeasing them, helping them get an understanding. You're safe with Sentinel One. We've got your back. You don't have to worry about this. Um, and you know, it, it's it's. I think for the industry, it's a revisiting of like what are good engineering practices in terms of how do we keep customers safe when we make changes to their environment and the endpoints like in their environment. It's one of the most sensitive apparatuses we can update, particularly if you're operating down at the kernel level. Mm -hmm. yeah, one of the big things that came out of that too and the conversation we're having here is that obviously a lot of products out there, a lot of vendors, a lot of uh, customers, a lot of tools, uh, product interoperability and integration is a big topic. How has the, the market dynamics changed between the vendors? Because now you have that incident which shows, I mean, the disruption kind of felt like Y2K should have happened. Like it, this, yeah. we felt it. I mean, normal people were exposed. Oh, it was Lights, Y2K hospital, it was like, straight up. Yeah. Thing, yeah. It crashed at, at that kind of scale and it still was the tip of the iceberg. So the market dynamics from the customer standpoint and the vendors, what do you see? What's the, uh, the, the blowback there? Well, I think it's less of a, a direct question about interoperability and more of a question around, there used to be a de facto in a board level conversation about how you secured your enterprise. And obviously that's come to question. And um, you know, CISOs, CIOs are being asked, like, what's the alternative? What, what are you going to do about this? Um, I also think it's the all in approach is definitely something that's going to get uh, revisited. It's not just going to be endpoint, it's going to be identity, other solutions, just because the robustness of uh, how you deal with reliability in the enterprise is now in question, and everybody's revisiting that. So I think you're going to see a lot of two vendor approaches in terms mm -hmm. of balancing that and not putting all of your eggs in one basket. Yeah. And, and probably multi endpoint solutions because nobody wants to just be siloed. Yeah, and I mean, it's a lot for, uh, for security teams to operate, but I think we're headed down that path pretty quickly. Um, so you'll probably see segregation of the assets within the enterprise with different endpoints on them. It's interesting on the, um, you know, we covered this last year, I think you were on theCUBE at our Mandian event where there was a law that just passed, or you know, if, if, if there's a breach, you have X number of t times, you know, days to submit a report. This was not a breach, it was disruption, but it, it had a similar effect. What is your uh, take on what um, policies change because you know, it used to be, hey, see, so I trust me, it's all going to work. To now, we have structure around what we do, liability policy. Um, you're seeing a lot more effort going into here's how we run things and documenting it. How has that changed? How do you see this impacting and, and ultimately multi vendors? A big part of that. I mean, it, it, it'll get pretty complicated. So I think from a liability perspective, most MSAs will be challenged in terms of liability caps. Um, so that's probably something that's going to get a revisit. Who knows how far that actually swings. Um, general insurers are going to put their own position in terms of like what the premiums are as a result of your vendor portfolio, not just the vendor that you use. It used to be very easy for you to work through that. Um, and then obviously, you know, we've got um, the federal government now digging into this, and I'm sure that there'll be an outfall of that as well, yet to be seen what that is. 
I mean, you, as the chief product and technology officer in one, you guys certainly will pick up probably some business from the, this this uh, effort. So we we'll probably see that happen over time. But what has it done for the product? Because with all these regulations and now compliance and yeah. policy, it's kind of a moving train because there's a product-led growth market going on, and the products are in transition because the market's shifting with Gen AI. So there's a lot of like industry pressures going on relative to how the platforms will work. Because you know it's the data problem. Security is about data and risk, right? So as the data starts to change with Gen AI, the data structures and the data platforms, how do you how do you put a box around that and say this is we did it yesterday? Now it's changed. It's a kind of a moving train. I mean, how do you rationalize that? So let's 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 unbundle a couple topics there. So I think when it comes to the endpoint discussion, which is probably the more pertinent discussion in terms of um, review of you know how you transact with vendors, what your yeah. approach is from an insurance perspective and liability perspective. I think that's actually a well-solved problem. Like what we have here is lack of adherence to you know basic principles of engineering. So phase deployment, tiered deployment right. in terms of customer risk, it's really managing how you put change into those environments, and that's the industry standard. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about the data aspect of it, um, I think it lays into the multi-vendor solution because you can imagine that there'll be multiple sensors out there, multiple forms of telemetry, they all need to go into one aggregate space, obviously they're going to pick you know, their select data lake or SIM to sit there and, and connect to that. And then the intelligence aspect of it is the thing that you layer over top of that. And you're really not going to get scale unless you can actually co-locate all of that into one mechanism. Now, the good news is that's not operationally um, risky compared to what we've seen with the endpoints, because this is not like perforated on your laptops across the enterprise or your servers or your revenue generating environments. This is isolated to a data lake that can go up and down and flex and not you know, impact those environments. What you lose is visibility and detection, yeah. and not a great thing, but you're not going to shut down the company as a result of that. Right. Right, and, you have, and your end customers, whoever they might be, have that comfort at least. Yes. Now, going to policy, the real risk in, in terms of you know, putting those apparatuses in place is um, how are you adhering to PII, PCI compliance, and things of that nature, and making sure that those models don't evolve in the wrong direction. How is AI and Gen AI playing a role in the conversations you've been having over the week or the last couple of months? Uh, so, I mean, we have a, a pretty well-vetted solution that came out a um, few, few quarters ago, Purple AI. Mm -hmm. um, it plays a significant role in terms of how we operate as a business. Um, you know, if you actually venture down to our demo booth, we have a, uh, a mortal versus machine demo where we actually pit people against the machine in terms of uh, threat hunting activity. Fun. So, you know, one group of people, they use the standard language and interfaces that we've got. The other yeah. group of people actually operates it through Purple AI. and. We've yet to see a mortal actually beat the machine in this case. So it's, um, it's very conducive to you know, helping security engineers up-level their game, get you know, to the bottom of their backlog, actually manage the workload that they continuously mm -hmm. are burdened with. So you know, we think it makes companies more efficient from a security standpoint and ultimately makes them safer because they're getting you know, further down that alert backlog. Yeah. You get to work with a lot of different companies across verticals. Are there any trends within those verticals that you're seeing in terms of their approach to security? Is everyone on the same page? Tell us. I mean, it, 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 it varies widely. Um, I had a feeling it might. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, there's different industries have their different point of view, and then if you look at the stratification of the market, just based off of what they can do economically in terms of the team that they develop, like, you know, there's different sizings. Um, our SMBs generally would like try and take on as much of the platform as possible because mm -hmm. it's shrink wrap for them to be able to use, particularly when we're looking at the MSSP channel. But as you move up, you know, then it's like people are trying to pick best of breeds or use our platform as a hub to actually bring um, uh, other vendors together. So kind of all over their security journey. Yes, I think, I think there's a lot of different um, views in terms of um, methodology. What are some of the most common vulnerabilities or risks that you see when you start engaging with a new brand? I mean, uh, honestly, it depends on the environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, cloud misconfiguration still dominates everything. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's a matter of human error and then trying to clean that up. And then once you get through that, then you can actually start looking at actual vulnerabilities, you know, CVEs mm -hmm. that are out there that need to be um, reconciled and patched. And then the next level is really looking at lateral movement and detecting you know, actual um, threat actors within your environment. 
but you know that first tranche yeah. ultimately stops the second tranche, um, and it's still you know where the boatload of work is. You get to talk to a lot of CISO, a lot of customers. Also, you have the internal facing teams, engineering products. So you got to kind of have the keys to the kingdom on the product engineering side, as well as looking at the customers. Um, CISOs that we talk to and that we do surveys with, mainly on on the qualitative side it's clear that there's a reset going on. They're looking at the distributed computing paradigm, which is evolving quickly, cloud, public cloud, on-premise and edge, uh, and the data layer changing radically with Gen of AI. They all kind of have this mindset of like, let's reset the platform for the next 20 years. So they're trying to, there's a lot of engineering going on. Um, yeah, data science has been around, got analytics, that's not going away. But data is being kind of decoupled from the database. And that's, you know, changing the data lake market. How is those conversations going on with you guys and the customers? Are they, what, is, what does that look like? What does that whiteboard look like when they say, okay, I want to have a true enterprise, data's got to be highly available, horizontally scalable, generative AI apps are going to have intelligence in them, open table formats are coming, governance catalogs are now the, the key sweet spot. Um, a lot of stuff is in flux. What is, what's the whiteboard look like? What, what do you guys talk about with customers and what are they thinking? Uh, the last stat that I looked at, only about 15% of workloads had been migrated to the public cloud. And so when you look at that, there's still a strong pull in terms of on-premise private mm -hmm. data center management. And there's definitely a barrier in terms of integrating visibility across those environments. Um, and they're looking for a solution to do that. And that's, I mean, that's really our bread and butter. So we look at it from an on-prem perspective, we look at it from a public cloud perspective, we can look at traditional endpoint, we look at it from a cloud perspective, um, and we can manage you know, multi-cloud environments for you in terms of you being able to understand your posture and lock them down in terms of runtime um, protection. Um, I think that, that as you evolve down the AI track, like there's a lot of purchasing of hardware for those private cloud environments, and on top of that, there's a growing concern about data as an asset. Yes. Uh, people had loosened up on it for a while and were pumping it to the cloud. So there seems to be a little bit more consternation about that motion. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how long li lived it'll be because you also have the friction of supply. You know, getting access to all the GPUs that you need and all the machinery to, to run in those data centers is becoming growingly difficult. And you've got these large scale vendors, the hyperscalers that um, are providing those amply. So, I think there's a strong tension. I don't think there's an answer yet. I think that was well stated, and I do. I think we, you can agree or not agree with me, but I think we're going to see that tension for a little bit still. For sure. I think we're looking at another 18 months of people figuring it out. I think, I think it's probably well past that. Yeah. I mean, this is definitely a, a moment of like, you know, when the web came, mobile came, it's a mm -hmm. change in terms mm -hmm. of how we interact with devices and whatnot. But in terms of the vetting of the use cases, I mean, if, particularly if you're looking yeah. at the earnings reports in the market, there's still a large mm -hmm. capital deployment going on mm -hmm. and not a lot of return, which really leads you to believe that they're still looking for answers in terms of what are we actually solving. It's still R&D, essentially, yeah. In, yeah. in a lot of cases or, or micro use cases that are getting built out a bit. I think it's really interesting. I was in doing my homework for you. There's some investment publications who are very hot on y'all right now, both in lieu of the incident, but also in terms of your growth. What's next for the company? Well, I mean, we are on a track to um, be more competitive in cloud. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously we're positioning against some of the more dominant players there, um, one notable. Um, and then in the AI seam space, we've rebranded our data lake to be AI seam. Um, which is more apt in terms of representation. So we're actually moving quickly this year to start taking on uh, next generation seam takeouts, oh. uh, which really repositions us in terms of you know competing with Splunk and other vendors in that yeah. space. Yeah. So more and more and more market share. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, when it comes down to it, I mean, we started off in EDR and mm -hmm. endpoint. Um, you know, the dominant data that you actually put into those kind of apparatuses is EDR. Mm -hmm. So it just makes it easier for the customer. They're not having to move it around. You know, it's their resident, and then they can pair it and correlate with any other data set that they want to enter into the data lake. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. All right, I ask the smartest of our guests this question because it's nice to have your futurism perspective. When we are sitting down at Black Hat next year, mm -hmm. what do you hope to be able to say that you can't say today? Ooh. Um, how about what I don't want to talk about uh, next year? Which, yeah. Which is like reliability and scalability. I'd, li I'd love. I would love to put that conversation behind us all. You know, at an industry level, um, 
just because it's not it's, it's just not great for the cyber community in general. Mm -hmm. People are always are already reticent about you know cyber in general. They're worried about threat actors. Like it's a scary space, particularly when you know too much about it. So add this uncertainty. Like it's really just not good for us right. in general. Yeah. But the problems don't go away. Yeah, I, I'd love to see that go away. I mean, I would imagine that Black Hat um, next year is probably going to have a stronger look at terms of. Um, how we are locking down from a data perspective, mm -hmm. what's trafficking in our environments to these um, LLMs. But in there, I think you're gonna see a little bit of play in terms of the shift of where the models live. You'll probably also see um, a large component of like starting to own that life cycle. Mm -hmm. If you look at the, the whole shift left um, apparatus around data science and how you manage that, it's pretty anemic. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not something that's ever been safeguarded. And it's not only important now from the perspective of cyber, but it's also just important in terms of engineering and making sure that you have reliability around that because it's been, I'd say, pretty shoddy in terms of like the broad market. It's table this. stakes at this point, I feel like. Yes, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of maturity that has to happen there. Yeah, great. Well, hopefully we've solved that and, and the whole market dynamic has risen above that yes. conversation so we can be focusing on more fun and sophisticated things. I completely agree. Yeah, <laughs> I love it, Rick. Agree. Thank you so yeah, much for taking the time to hang out with us. This always was awesome. John, always a joy. And thank all of you fine human beings for tuning into our two days of coverage here at Black Hat in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for cybersecurity news.